Jesus is in every book of the Bible. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman, a descendant of Abraham, a king in the line of Judah in the order of Melchizedek. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb, the leader, the deliverer out of slavery like Moses, the manna from heaven. In Leviticus, he's the high priest, personified by the sacrifices and the offering. In Numbers, Jesus is the cloud by day and the fire by night, the Messiah that would be king, the healer in the bronze serpent. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is the prophet like Moses, worshiped by the angels in the cities of refuge. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation, the leader into the promised land, the commander in chief of the army. In Judges, Jesus is the judge and the lawgiver, the true judge for the living and the dead. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer, the descendant of Boaz and Ruth. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, Jesus is the prophet of the Lord, exalted by God, a descendant of David. In 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicle, Jesus is the reigning king in the millennial reign, multiplying bread and healing the leper. In Ezra, Jesus is the faithful scribe, the builder of the temple. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken down walls, broken down marriages, broken down dreams. In Esther, he's Mordecai, he's my guardian. He's my protector. In Job, he's the day spring from on high. He's the sufferings and the subsequent blessings. In Psalms, he's the Lord, my shepherd, the resurrected son of God, who was despised and crucified, hated without a cause, rejected by the Israelites, but now seated at the right hand of God. In Proverbs, he's my wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the fear of the Lord that leads to life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant. He's a light to the Gentiles. He's whipped for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet. He's the righteous branch. He's our righteousness. In Ezekiel, he's the son of man, a descendant of David. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fire. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. He's the everlasting king. In Hosea, he's the bridegroom that stays faithful even to the backslidden woman. In Joel, he's baptized with Holy Spirit and fire, bringing salvation to all mankind. In Amos, Jesus is my burden bearer. Dark in the day at noon during the Messiah's death. In Obadiah, he's my mighty savior. In Jonah, he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, but he rose again and he's a forgiving God. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet, born in Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's the great evangelist. He's crying for revival. In Zephaniah, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Haggai, he's the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, he's the pure son, the priest and the king who would ride in on a donkey. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the king. He's the song of David. He's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the servant. He's the holy one of God. He's the king of Israel. In Luke, he's the horn of our salvation, the consolation of Israel. In John, he's the bread of life. He's the great I am. He's the vine and we're the branches. In Acts, he's the ascended Lord, the Prince of life, the judge of the living and the dead. In Romans, he's my justifier. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the first fruit and the last Adam. In Galatians, he's the one who sets me free. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of riches, the head of all things. He's my cornerstone. In Philippians, he's Jehovah Jireh, my God shall meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead, the image of the invisible God. He's the head of the church. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's the soon coming king. He's the Lord of peace. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's my mediator between God and me. In Titus, he's my faithful pastor, my blessed hope. In Philemon, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood that washes away all of my sins. He's my faithful high priest. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. In James, he's my doctor, my great physician. He's the judge at the door. In first and second Peter, he's my shepherd. He's the living stone. In first and second and third John, he's the everlasting love. He's the eternal life, the righteous one. In Jude, he's the Lord who came down with 10,000 saints, the only wise God and Savior. And in Revelation, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the great I am. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the fountain of living water. He's the bright and morning star. He's 
is above every sickness, every demonic attack. There's no other name. You're the truth. You're the way. When I speak your name, praise God. Well, it's the opening night of conference. Y'all stay up here. Y'all play a little bit. We're going to have an amazing week. And, you know, I thought about this past year. I thought, how should we start off conference? Who should we have to come kick it off? And I'll never forget when I was in the back room with Pastor Brian Houston, probably five years ago, he came to preach at Victory's Conference in 2015. How many of y'all were here for 2015 conference when we, the theme was onward, onward. And he said, um, who kicked off the conference? And I said, I, uh, we had, I think Jensen Franklin kicked it off. And he said, well, why didn't you kick it off? I said, me, I'm the pastor of the church. I'm not gonna kick it off. And he goes, well, don't you think that the church needs to hear what you have to say about the conference? I said, well, uh, <laughs> I was like, they hear me every week. And he goes, Paul, in this Australian voice, he was like, Paul, you need to kick off the conference. <laughs> And I was like, yes, sir. One of these days I will do that. So this is the first year that I'm helping kick off our conference. Talk about making history, like Ashley said. And, um, you know, I don't have like a ton of profound things to share because I feel like you guys hear me every week sharing, you know, what I think about the Bible and what God says to me and what God's saying to our church. But I do feel like I have a passage that I want to read to you tonight that comes from the book of Isaiah. And it's a passage that's been really stirring in my heart for our church and for my life and for your life. And so if you got a Bible, go to Isaiah 61. Yes, Isaiah 61. And this is a prophetic passage. The prophet Isaiah was writing something that one day Jesus would say. And it would be the words that Jesus would start his ministry with. This passage has been stirring in my heart because this has been a crazy year. And I heard God say back in March that this year God was going to give favor to bold people. That bold people would magnetically uh, walk in the favor of God. I felt it, I just, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was thinking about this cartoon that my kids watch called Jake and the Neverland Pirates. And in the cartoon, uh, there's this moment where this boy says, fortune favors the bold, fortune favors the bold. And I woke up in the middle of the night, but it wasn't saying that. It was saying, God favors the bold, God favors the bold, God favors the bold. And I thought, uh, I don't know how to, how to explain that to people who would think that I'm, you know, connecting Jake and the Neverland Pirates in the Bible. But then God began to highlight stories like Daniel when he opened his windows and they said, you can't pray to any other God, but he had an open church service and he started praying and worshiping the one true God. I thought about Daniel in the lion's den. I thought about David taking on Goliath and Esther speaking up to the king. And, and I thought about Mordecai challenging Esther. And I thought about, you know, all of the different stories. Abraham going to a country he'd never been to. The boldness, the audacity. I started thinking about Gideon. Uh, the, the boldness to take on an army that was 3,000 times bigger than his group of 300 men. And all of these stories in the Bible. Peter walking on water. Paul and Silas praising God in the jail cell. Uh, when you go through the list of characters in the Bible, Paul the Apostle, when he was shipwrecked and he's on an island, he's bit by a snake, and yet God uses him to minister and lead all these islanders to Jesus. It all required boldness. And I started thinking about how that boldness, this is a year for bold Christians to rise up. This is a year for, not bold, this is a year for Christians to become bold. This is a year for uh, followers of Jesus to rise up in courage. And in order to do that, you gotta know that God's hand is on your life. And so we come to Isaiah 61 verse one, and it says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. That's what I wanna preach to you tonight. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Somebody say, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Turn to someone next to say, the spirit of the Lord is on you. What is the spirit of the Lord? It's a spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit that glorifies God. It's a spirit of faith. It's a spirit of power. It's a spirit of love, a sound mind. It's a spirit of courage. It's a spirit of creativity. 
You think about when God stepped on the scene, his spirit hovered over the earth. There was chaos, there was darkness, and that spirit breathed life and creative powers over what seemed chaotic. God brought order. He brought organization. When you have the spirit of the Lord on you, you start walking in authority. You start walking in creativity. The spirit of the Lord reminds you who you are. The spirit of the Lord gives you empowerment to do what God's called you to do. So when I started getting a revelation that God's spirit is on me in this hour, and I was thinking about all the conferences that we've had, I was thinking, you know, going back to before I was born, Victory started having conferences before we had a church. My mom and dad had this courage as 20 year olds out of college that they were gonna host a conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, they started bringing in speakers from all over. And they started doing that in 1989, 1979, 1979. And I was born during the conference of 1985. My mom was leading worship, took a break, had me in the hospital. My dad said that I had to be born between the sessions because he didn't want to miss a service. Thanks, Dad. I love you. He was there. He was there. And, uh, <laughs> but I was born in a time like this. And I started thinking, you were born for such a time as this. You were born for what God wants to do in this hour. I was born in that conference. I was, I was birthed. I believe God's going to birth some things in this conference in you. I believe God's going to deliver some things through you. I believe God's going to deliver you out of some things at this conference. And so I started thinking about all the conferences growing up. John and I, we would have snacks on the second row. We would have gummy bears. We would have honey roasted peanuts. We would have saltine crackers. We had, you know, all kinds of snacks and drinks because the preachers went six hours back then. Benny Hinn would be casting out stuff and slaying people. And John was reminding me today, he was like, you remember when Tim's story came and he, he slayed both of us in the spirit and we didn't know what to do. And so we laid on the floor and took a nap for the rest of the sermon. We were, we were just re reminiscing on growing up in, in Victory Conference, growing up in Word Explosion. And, uh, and we were thinking about all of these years and the year that Evander Holyfield got up and preached and, and Reggie White. We started thinking about, you know, all of these conferences and I just had this feeling in my heart that this year is different than any other conference. That 2020 has a special mark on it. This is the spirit of the Lord. This is the year of God's favor. This is the year that God wants to do something supernatural in the church. The spirit of the Lord. Somebody say, the spirit of the Lord is on me. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me. What spirit is trying to steal, kill, and destroy the spirit of God in you? I was talking with my friend Sean Foyt, who was just with us last week, and he was leading worship for us. He lives in Redding, California, and God stirred in his heart to go and do outdoor worship services in California when the governor said, no one's allowed to sing, no one's allowed to worship. They're banning singing songs in, in churches across California. And Sean just said, we're going to get out there. We're going to worship because there's a double standard in this state. And they do not want churches to do anything or have any impact in any neighborhoods. And they're trying to silence the church and shut down the church. And so he started doing this and people started coming from all over California. Well, just this last week, he said, I'm going to head to Portland. Pray for me because there's riots across Portland. And I said, Sean, you are going in to rebuild ancient ruins. You are going in where the enemy has stolen and, and killed and destroyed part. You're going to go and you're going to breathe life. He said, we're, we're titling this um, worship night riots to revival. And so they went out there and they began to worship and 6,000 people showed up in Portland, Oregon to worship God as rioters and protesters tried to stop them from singing. They started singing louder. People got saved. People got baptized. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to be bold. He's anointed me to speak up. He's anointed me to love. He's anointed me to forgive. He's anointed me to live for him. And so then he said, we're going to Seattle next. Now, Seattle has had entire streets blocked off where they say, uh, we don't want any police officers around here. We don't want any governmental leaders. We're going to do what we want to do. And he said, we're going there to bring reconciliation. 
And he said there was pastors in that city that had never talked to each other, black and white pastors that had never connected, but they showed up on a field, 8,000 people, black pastors, white pastors, Asian pastors, Native American pastors, and they begin to weep and repent for the racism that's happened in their city. And they begin to worship. Come on, God is on the move in America. Don't get sucked into all the negative news you see on MSM, mainstream media. God is up to something. There's revivals happening. So he said, we started worshiping and Antifa showed up and all of these protesters started throwing stuff at us, started shouting, hail Satan. There was a group of Satanists that started coming through our, our field and they started uh, trying to hurt people. Then they rushed the stage. They tried to tackle me. This was just two nights ago in, in Seattle. And he said, they rushed the stage. They tried to tackle me. Then they picked up our guitars, our guitar pedals. They started breaking our drums. Then they pushed over our generator. They broke our generator. But he said, our crowd kept singing, our God reigns. Our God reigns forever, your kingdom reigns, our God reigns. He said, we just started singing louder. And there was this protester that started shouting a, a bunch of obscene bad words at us and said, I don't know what's wrong with these people. Every time we cuss them out, every time we shout hail Satan, they get louder. They won't stop. These people are different and they're so happy and they're having fun and they're dancing and they're smiling. Can I tell you, the church cannot be stopped. When the Spirit of the Lord is on you, no demon in hell can stop you. No plot of the devil can stop what heaven has started. Heaven's hand is on you in this hour. Someone say, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. I just wrote down some spirits that I think have been trying to mess with people that I've encountered. I think for some people, there's been a spirit of fear. Just a spirit of intimidation. Well, Paul, if I do that, what, what will people think? If we, if we say that, what will people do? They're going to cancel us because it's cancel culture and everybody's getting canceled. Fear keeps us locked in a prison, never discovering the freedom and the hope and the boldness that the spirit of the Lord wants us to walk in. Don't buy into the lie of fear. That's the, that's the one thing that I pray you get tonight, that there is a spirit that's trying to combat the spirit of the Lord on you. It's a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of what people might think, what they might do. The fear of God not showing up. The fear of God not providing. Paul, what if we don't make it? What if our business goes under? What if we don't get out of debt? What if things get worse? What if our nation doesn't make it? I want you to declare right now over your mind, over your heart, over your kids, over your family. Say, I'm not going under. I'm not going down. I'm not going to be defeated. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And He has anointed me. He has anointed me. And I've got the victory. Come on, church. You've got the victory tonight. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He's, he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I just feel to bless someone here tonight. If you're in the room and you're a single parent and you have had the worst time ever with your transportation needs, would you stand up if that's you? Maybe you don't even have a car. Maybe you got here tonight. I see one, I see two. I see three, I see four, five, six, seven. All I know is that this church is the most generous church in the world. And here's what I know. Tonight, we are gonna bless at least one of you with a car on behalf of this church. So here's what I want you to do. Because we wanna bless all of you and we eventually will. That's the kind of church we are. Come on, church, is that the kind of church we are? When there's a need, we rise up to it. So here's what we're gonna do. Pastor AJ is going to connect with you right after, Pastor AJ, will you stand up? Right after service, whoever just stood up, 
I want you to connect with Pastor AJ because we came tonight to proclaim good news. We, pro- we came tonight not just to talk about good news, but to show some good news. That God sees you, he cares about your needs, and you are close to his heart. And tonight, we're gonna bless at least one of you and the rest of you don't, get, don't get discouraged. Don't let a spirit of fear or, oh, they're not gonna take care of me. God is your source. Tonight's a testimony for you to get your faith up that if he could do it for her, he could do it for you. If he could do it for them, he could do it for your family. Come on, some of y'all aren't clapping like God's gonna do something for you. So right after service, I want you to connect with Pastor AJ because we're gonna celebrate tomorrow night at conference. Someone's getting a car. Someone's getting a brand new car. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness those who are in prison, to proclaim this is the year of God's favor. Someone say that with me. This is the year of God's favor. Today, as I was just going over this scripture and I was meditating on it, I was sitting in my office And I kid you not, I'm by myself. I'm sitting in my office and (laughs) this is really funny. I don't know if the cameras can catch this. There was something on the ground and and my office was kind of like dimly lit because I was worshiping. I had the worship music on, had the Bible on. And I, I get down near the ground and there's this critter. Can you guys see this right here? Do you guys see this critter right here? Do y'all see that? There it is right there. This thing was in my office today and I jumped out on my skin. I go, whoa, what? Y'all are like, what just happened? (laughs) I screamed. Ashley knows I'm a jumpy guy. I jumped and, uh, and it ended up being one of my kids, little critters. It's a rubber, rubber critter. I was almost tempted during worship to put it on Ashley and just to see how she reacted. But I'm, I'm a nice husband. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> but this little thing scared me. And I think so many people are scared by little things. And I started thinking about Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, where the Israelites had been sent into the promised land to spy out what God had in store for them. And when you read Numbers 13, it says they, they found grapes that were bigger than them. They found fruit that was larger than any fruit they'd ever seen. A land flowing with milk and honey. God was about to take, take them into somewhere great. It was the year of favor for the Israelites. God had delivered them out of the hands of Pharaoh. He had parted the Red Sea. They had momentum. It was their year. And yet they forfeited their year of favor. They forfeited their year of favor, they said, We look like grasshoppers in their sight. That's what this is, this is a grasshopper. I thought it was a spider in my office. It was just a little grasshopper, but it scared me. And they said, we are so scared. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. And I started thinking about how so many people forfeit the favor of God on their life because they have a view of themselves and a view of the year that they're in and a view of the problems that they're facing, where instead of seeing yourself bigger than this guy, I am so much bigger than this guy. Why did this guy scare me? Once I found him, I started having fun. I'm gonna scare a bunch of you guys with this. I'm gonna put this out in the lobby. I'm I'm gonna put this on your shoulder while I'm talking to you. The thing that was sent to scare me now is my prop to remind myself that I am so much bigger than these problems that are facing me and my church and my family and my house and my health. You are so much bigger. I was even scared to preach tonight. I really was. I called Ashley. I was like, I don't know. And God said, stop it. The spirit of the Lord is upon you. You are anointed to proclaim good news to your church. You've been sent to set captives free, people who are captive in their mind, captive to fear, people who are in prison to shame, to provide for those who are grieving, to comfort those who are mourning, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That's what the church is called to do, to bring 
beauty for ashes. Ashes represents death. And as we get ready to go into this conference, I believe God wants to breathe life into you. In fact, this last week, I got a phone call from one of our families in the church who attends the 9 a.m. service, and they said, can you come up to the hospital? I said, yes, I know what's going on. One of our teachers and a dear friend to Ashley and I, we led her on mission trip. She's a young girl. I believe she's 29 years old or 30, 20, 27 years old. She fainted at work just last week on Tuesday at a teacher's meeting, and she thought maybe she was fatigued, needed water, they rushed her to the hospital and found out that she had blood clots and one of her arteries was 95% blocked to the heart and they had to immediately do surgery. And while they were doing surgery, she coded on the table for 10 minutes, she died. And when they finished surgery, they got her, they got her heart to pump again, but the activity in the brain had, she wasn't responding. And they sat down with the family and they said, listen, this is, this is it. Uh, if she comes, we don't, want you get, we don't want you to get your hopes up. And John, her husband, they've been married for a few years. They've been believing God to get pregnant. And he's, you know, crying. And, and our teachers, everyone's going, what do we do? What do we do? This is so bizarre how fast this happened. She was here at work. She was ready to teach school. And, and, and so we're all praying and I come up to the hospital room and there's no response. We're praying, there's no response. Her body's not responding. So on Sunday, I'm preaching. And I'm preaching about digging ditches. In other words, taking an action of faith to believe that God is gonna fill those ditches with rain. And, and you gotta believe it and you gotta speak it and you gotta act on it. How many of y'all were here when I was talking about digging ditches? So I'm talking about it and something comes on me because Early in the service, we didn't mention her name during the hospital list in prayer time. And I just said, Ashley, I speak to you in Jesus' name to come back to life. And we pray right now, God, that you are waking Ashley up as I begin to speak it and prophesy it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed. He's anointed you, church. He's anointed you. Not for your favor, but for the favor that God wants to bring through you to people around you. When I began to speak it, I got a text message in service. They said, while you were praying, she started twitching her body, twinkling her eye. They said, this is, this is huge. You got to understand that any movement is a celebration. Have you ever been in a season where just even the twinkling of an eye is a praise report? Have you ever been in a season where you'll just take a twitch? If you get a twitch, if you just know this marriage has at least a little bit of life left in it, this kid has a little, there's some, God's not finished with your son yet. God's not finished with your business yet. Some of us get so focused on the negative, we miss those little moments to praise God. And they said, you gotta, we got, you gotta know, this is huge. I said, I know, because we were there, and she wasn't moving. Then I got a text message this morning, and I posted it on Instagram, and I've got my phone, because I wanna make sure I say it right. But this morning, I get a text message from John. John, if you're watching out there with Ashley, we just are praying right now that God's only going to continue doing amazing things. So this morning, I get a text saying, she's not just twitching now, she's answering questions. We're asking her questions and she's nodding and she's going like this and this. And then I got a text message this afternoon and they said the MRI has been moved to tomorrow but she was sitting on the side of the bed with occupational therapy. And they believe that she will be able to stand within the next day or two. She's moving and lifting all of her limbs. She's becoming coherent every minute. We still got a long road ahead, but she's healed, Paul. The doctors are amazed. Listen to this, church. They said after the first MRI, they said she, she virtually had no chance of being functional ever again. And less than a week later, they believe she's going to stand in the next few days. God is good, Paul. God is good. God is good. This is the year of the Lord's favor. He said, can you pass that along? Can you pa I'm passing it along right now. I keep getting more text messages from them. Oh my goodness. Guys, I, all I'm saying is that God is doing, 
She said, he said, now she's mouthing words. She's, she's actually opening her mouth and mouthing words. I asked if she was okay and she nodded. Paul, God is good. Come on, Jesus. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to deliver those that are in darkness, to bring beauty instead of ashes, an oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now I wanna say something right here. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. In other words, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on a garment of praise. Mark, can I use your jacket for a second? You gotta put it on. Praise doesn't come naturally. I don't have to feel like praising to praise. I don't have to feel like going to church to go. I don't have to feel like reading my, I don't have to feel. Sometimes we are accepting our feelings as the dictator and the driver of our life. And Isaiah said, no, 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 no. Put on the garment of praise instead of that spirit of heaviness. Put on that garment of praise. I know you don't feel like it, but you need to praise. You need to get your praise in front of your miracle. You need to get your worship. That's what we started doing in the hospital room. That's what one of these single moms started doing before she got a car. She put on the garment of praise tonight, not knowing that God had a car lined up for her. You have no clue what's on the other side of your praise. You don't know what God's about to do. 2020 is not over yet. Stop acting like the year's over. God has something up his sleeve. I know you think bad things are happening, but God has something good. God has something good. And then he says this, can I finish Isaiah 61 and then we'll, and we'll finish up here. He says, um, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild ancient ruins. They will restore the places that have long been devastated. God's going to use you to rebuild. God's going to use this church to restore areas that have been devastated. God's going to do it in Ashley's body. God's going to do it in your marriage. You will be called, verse six, you will be called priests to the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. In their riches, you will boast. Instead of the shame you've been walking around with, you're gonna get a double portion. You know, when I read the New Testament, every single thing that's in this passage shows up in the New Testament in various ways. Jesus steps on the scene. He says, I've been anointed. The Spirit of God is on me. Then in John, he says, you're anointed. Yeah, that's scriptural. People go, oh, that's out of context. That's straight out of context. No, it's straight in context. You just aren't reading your Bible enough to recognize it's in context. God did not put you on the earth on accident for an accident. You're here on purpose, and he's anointed you. And when, the, when the, he said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on all sons and daughters, they will prophesy, they will rebuild, they will restore. They're gonna inherit, a you're gonna do greater things than I did, Jesus said. A double portion of his anointing. Instead of being disgraced, you're gonna be in rejoicing. You're gonna have a, an inheritance, a double portion of your land. Everlasting joy will be yours. Before I end tonight, I wanna show you something. You can take a seat real fast and then we're gonna close out with a song. But he just keeps on going on here. And I wrote this down in my notes because at the start of this year, we were not done yet with raising what we needed to raise for that building. And God said, don't worry, it's gonna be finished. It's, gonna, it's all gonna come in. And I wanna show you real quick a video uh, that just shows what God's been up to. When you, when you start walking in that understanding, that identity, that authority, that victory, that God has some, if fear did not have any power over your life, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do, what would you believe for if you knew God was gonna come through? How would you live? What kind of ministry would you build? What kind of company would you build if you knew you could not fail? What vision would you cast to the church if you knew God was gonna make it happen? That's what God began to stir in me. He said, Paul, dream big, dream big and watch what I'll do. Ask for the nation. The spirit of the Lord is on you. And so I want to just show you real quick, and then we're going to close out with a worship song because this week is a dedication week of a brand new building that God has called our church to walk into and your kids and your kids, kids and your teenagers. Check this out. A few years ago, God dropped it in my heart that one day we would 
move our Bible college on this side of the street. One day we'd move our youth group on this side of the street. I started seeing this idea of a building. I didn't even know this, but I was in my dad's office and I found blueprints that were never completed. And he, I was like, God, how's that gonna happen? Because when, when my dad passed, I just thought the best days were behind us. God said, stop it, stop discounting yourself. I'm gonna do so much more in you and through you. You ain't seen nothing yet, Paul. A couple weeks ago, we started putting in the footers for our new building that we're building here as a church. And I went out there with my phone and I captured footage of the big crane coming and driving the steel down into the ground. Now, no one's gonna see that steel because they're cutting it off and it's footers, it's beneath the ground. But I got so excited, I was smiling, I was jumping, and I was going, God, thank you, the work is beginning. Do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. We are not called to just survive as a church, as Christians, to make zero impact on the economy of our city, on the economy of our nation. We're not just here to make a spiritual impact. We're here to make an impact on every part of society. Come on, church. That's your new building right there. That's your new building. You know, I was thinking about, just as we finish tonight, this summer, Ash and I, we were hiking and we came to a spot, I came to a spot without her, uh, in Wyoming called Old Faithful, and it's in Yellowstone. And right as I was walking up, everyone that was standing out there, they'd been waiting for an hour, all of a sudden the water starts shooting up into the air. And it just wouldn't stop, it was exploding. And I thought, this is the craziest thing, I've never seen anything like this. And yeah, there's, there's some pictures back there. You know, I'm taking selfies, <laughs> sending them to Ashley. Look at this. The water was exploding. And I looked up, I said, why does it erupt like that? And it said, it gets to a point where it gets so on fire. It gets so boiling hot beneath the ground that all of a sudden there's something that it just can't stay down. And it, whoo, it erupts. And what I feel like God wants to do tonight is I think God wants to erupt something in your life, in this church. Will you stand to your feet tonight? There's a vision God wants to erupt in you. There's a praise that God wants to erupt in you. There's a resurrection miracle testimony, Ashley, that God wants to erupt out of you. Jonathan, Melissa, Tony, there's, there's an eruption that God's saying, you've been going through so much stuff. You've been in the middle of so many setbacks. God must be setting you up for an incredible testimony. You're gonna, you're gonna erupt, but here's the key. I think God's saying you've gotta erupt with praise before you begin to see the eruption of his miracle in your life. You've got to erupt with faith because the Israelites had to get it in here that we are not grasshoppers. We are not too small for this problem. This problem is too small for our God. This is an easy thing. God's going to conquer this land. So as we finish tonight, would you close your eyes across this room? And I want to invite you all over this place just that you would say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. My heart is ready for whatever you want to do. And Ben, I want you to just lead us into that song. Lead us into that song. And as they do, if you want to, leave your seat. Come down to this altar. I don't know who I'm speaking over, but there's someone here tonight that God was speaking to you, that you would get your heart ready for what he's about to do in your life, that you would get ready for a miracle he's about to bring in your family, in your finances, in your marriage, that you would begin to speak it over yourself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. That you would begin to get it deep down in your spirit. And as that gets deep down, that you would begin to erupt with the spirit of faith, with the spirit of hope, with the spirit of praise, with the garment of worship tonight. Whatever you're facing, just bring it to the altar. Just bring it right now to God and begin to speak the Word of God over it. Begin to worship Him over whatever that thing is. Overflowing this
And you turn it for good You turn it for good lost a battle 
Cause you never lost a battle You never lost a battle You never lost a battle And I know, I know You never will You can